Okay, my outstanding friends, this is going to be interesting. We're going to be talking about fractals. Now, this is a big thing coming up. Oh, everybody's talking about fractals. Well, what are they? They're repeating patterns. And you see them in nature, like in the way plants develop in a circle and all that stuff. What causes that? How does that happen? And then there's other things. I specifically look into light for the fractal patterns because those are the basis of everything. And they're all the same. And I'm going to show you some very interesting shots of light changing from light not into light and then back into light again. I'm not kidding you. It's unbelievable. It's fission and fusion. The light starts as light. It creates fission, and then when it comes back together, it's fusion, and then it turned back into light again. I'll show you this happening right now. Okay, I'm going to try to make this not too, too long. This is the particles that Fermilab has found. That has all the weight, and this has all the energy. And this one never changes in size, and I show this in our experiments, which are right here. This is, again, the Fermilab particles, and these are the ones we found. They say they have a glowy edge around them. Absolutely. They never change size, the black ones. The two black ones, they just never change size. Now, when they are together like this, they're just like two bar magnets. However, when we put that through the Venturi, it accelerated and exploded and created electron showers and muons, sterile muons. And here's what it looks like here. What we did, here's what happens. You take the light, all right? That's a pulsed red laser. And it's just beginning to accelerate now. All right, so it's just beginning to move forward. That's why it's getting glowier out here. Now, this is the leading tip of it. We put, headed it towards a Venturi. And when it got into the influence of the Venturi, it had to accelerate. And the particle itself, which I'll show you in a second, is pulled directly out of the wave. Do you see that? And then here it exploded. This is a subatomic nuclear explosion. That's what it is. And here's what happened at the Venturi. And here's what happened during the, the particle's procession towards the Venturi. Here's what happens. Here's the particle heading out of the wave. Here it is in its neutrino phase. Neutrino means it's got energy, but it's not really full energy. And then it's another energy level over here. See sideways this way and not that way? These are the ones that are fully formed photons. And the reason they're fully formed is because they are being bashed back again so hard that that's when they make their bubble effect and they show up as photons. But it has to be that concussion backwards to bounce back against creating light. That's what these particles hit and they bounce back creating light. Here they think they hit a wall and and that's why the, you see them so perfectly. Now this and that's because of the bounce back and that's this wave right here. Where is it? Here, right here. I don't know if you can see that or not. Let me see if you, I can focus in on that. You see that wave going backwards? You see that? That's not supposed to happen. That's what's called reverse EMF, electromotive force. And that's a bounce back wave created by this subatomic nuclear explosion. And that's exactly what it is. You would never even see these light particles, which are coming forward. They're all over the place. They're everywhere. Moving this way because of that laser. But you never saw them because they're not accelerating or they're not being pushed back at. Here they are being pushed back at. So they pop up. This one's being accelerated forward. But here it shows up similar to these. And at this point, it's all, the game's on. And poof, luminosity means energy. There's no reason we shouldn't be able to harvest that energy right there that I can't think of. All right, that's electron showers. These are sterile muons. Let's look at them closely. Now, I'm doing this for Sabine. I hope she watches this because she's asking for these answers, and I think I have them. This is the muon neutrino atta attached to the electron neutrino. 
what's called a Diorac neutrino. You see the black and white? Right. A Majorna, I think, must be the neutrino phase. It's not quite a Diorac, which is really the black and white. So we're looking at, in our experiments, the true black and white. Well, there it is right here. These are two Diorac neutrinos, back to back, just like bar magnets, to create a stable photon. And that photon has a big round field around it. It's a magnetic field. You know what magnets are. You push them together, you can feel them. That's what the field is. And that's why they bounce. It's just like it's got to be some kind of a balloon effect. <laughs> that's all I could tell you. That's all I, it just seems it's got to be. Now I showed you that as those particles, black and white. Here they are here. The green is the same thing. No difference whatsoever. And these are the, the neutrino phases. Remember seeing these little particles in the red? Same thing. But the red is much faster. I, I mean, I'm sorry, the red is much slower. The green is much faster. And it's the spin that's faster. And uh, I can show you those both going at the same time through the same Venturi and the green is much more powerful. And the blue is here slowing down, coming through hot. You can't even tell there's two particles. But as it slows down, you can see there is two particles. So that's slowing down light, and this is accelerating light. There's no other way to see it. Not only that, this is fission, and that's fusion. And there's no other way to see that. Because when they were coming out, they would look like this. That's the particle, and that's the one where it's enhanced to show the energy levels. And you can see that the forward-leading one is concussing with all these little red dots in the front because those are nothing more than gases and electrons that are floating in the air, charged particles. And then when it hit the Venturi here, they just exploded and created the muons and electron showers. And here it is, right really up close, look at this. This is these coming in. Now there's a Venturi which brings this down into a tiny little slip. And because all these fields are crushed now, and the black is slapping it, and I mean it does, it slaps it. And because of the design of this particular Venturi, there's nothing allowed other than the white through. And the only reason we see the black is because it sits on top of the white. So we broke it away here from the white, so that's sterile muons, electron showers, and then the black just tries as hard as it can to get back. That's oh, This is what the strong nuclear force is. These are nuclear particles. These are subatomic nuclear particles. The only reason we see the black is because it's sitting on top of the white. The black is, is cold, absolutely cold. It, does, it gives off no energy whatsoever. It's attractive only, and it doesn't care. It's not repulsive. The black does not repel other blacks. They sit right on top of each other. It doesn't matter. And so they form a, a dark center surrounded by the white particles. When you're in this region, there's, there's only this is as small as you get, so you can see them very easily. You can see what they're made of. And they're made out of the black and white together, one here, one like that. A single one, in other words, an electron is 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 would, would be this right here. An electron would be that. And that's not going to be stable. It's not stable. It's not like light. Electron is not like light. Electron, an electron either wants to stick to something else, as a, like something that just hangs off as a charged particle, or it wants to incorporate into something as heat and bring the heat level up. But it's still hanging around inside. It's just not like static. All right, that's all heat is, is, is extra electrons. Even the more electrons you put in, the warmer something gets. And guess what? The warmer it gets, the heavier it gets. The only thing that gets lighter is gases because they expand. You heat something up, like if I took my buddy here, Caesar, my goose, Caesar Augustus, and if I heated him up, he'd get heavier. It wouldn't change. It wouldn't it'd be no difference whatsoever to them. It'd just be there's more particles that are heat particles. These are heat. And they would be in there and they would warm it up.
and then if, if, if it was if it was put that warm thing put into a cold environment those particles would seep out into the air to warm the air up that's all heat is the heat is just an exchange of these particles that's all it is and it's these particles here Right. The light, I suppose, would do basically the same thing, but basically it's excess electrons. When you turn your heater on, it just runs the electrons through, the electrons pump out into the air. Basically, that's how it works. So I think I've shown a pretty good case to say that these are the particles they found in Fermi Lab and CERN, no difference. And we found them here, but we use light instead of big, big, huge balls of particles. When they smash things, they get all this kind of nonsense everywhere. And then they dig through and they find, we found something like this and like that many, many, many times, the smallest things we ever found. So they must be the smallest things. And yes, I agree with that. They probably are because we started with light. And then we split them apart. Fission, fusion. Light accelerates, light slows down, light's a particle, light creates a wave, it's all right there in front of your face. And the black particle is dark matter and it's gravity. It solves virtually everything. Dipole electron flood theory is the way. All right, so don't forget, that's Fermi Lab, that's not me, I'm not making these statements. And they're also making the statements about the quantum foam that there is, the, the space is not empty. Empty space isn't empty. It's saturated with particles. I mean, they're everywhere. And this is my theory right here, dipole electron flood theory. That's what the nucleus looks like. And I believe it's a, just a completely black core surrounded by white particles. There is one other possibility, and I show it here. They, they could be layered, but I don't think so. I think it's, it's, it's this one here, where it's just black in the center and white you know different colors because the tightest ones are going to be in the blue range the next layer out is going to be in the green range the next layer out is going to be in the red range it's just the further away they are the less tightly held they are when the blue goes it's gone when the red goes it sort of doesn't go it's, it's not as tightly held all right so when you get down to where you're breaking off the blue bits you're really down really close to the nucleus. That's why hydrogen explodes so much, because that's the, the only particles you got is the ones surrounding the, the core. You're right down there in the blue. You ever hear hydrogen go off? <laughs> it's, uh, it's unbelievably loud, because it's the, the, every particle separates from every other particle. You end up with 1,823 of these. And I imagine the blacks and the whites separate and you end up with these too. I don't know. But when, when that nucleus goes off in a hydrogen explosion, you know, it, it, with, you need oxygen and hydrogen together. It, they just, it's just an enormous explosion. Now don't forget, I showed you the light. It comes through the air and it pushes everybody else in front of it and makes them glow. So this is the real pusher, and these are the shove they shove back. I call it push to shove. So that's why you see the, that there. Now, this is the acceleration, and that's the actual particle. And here's where it concusses against itself because it's bouncing back. It feels like it's hitting a wall right here. That's why it's turned into a white, glowy particle right there. And everything explodes at this point. You have fission and fusion. And this is complete separation of power. This it proves that the black slaps the white. You see it? It's slapping that white through there. And when you no white, I mean when no black can get through the venturi, only the white gets squirted through. And that's what the other venturi did right here. Only the white can get through here. So if we could harvest it right there, that's what you want. This is the stuff that makes your car run and makes all your electricity work. The black is all the weight. And when you charge a car up, it doesn't gain any weight. All it gains is the white. The black stays out. That's the whole idea of creating, uh, generating electricity. You're generating white and keeping the black away. You charge your car up, it weighs 4,000 pounds, empty. You charge it up, it weighs 4,000 pounds. It gains nothing. 
And if you drive it all day long, you come back, it still weighs 4,000 pounds. It doesn't matter. It's, it has no weight to this energy. And I can show that in a nuclear bomb blast. It's very simple to see. The house just smokes up like this. Not even anything even moves. Just all the combustibles smoke. And then a second later, the whole house goes. That's when the black catches up with the white. Just as we see in this other. Right here. The black, first of all, the white would burn a house up and then phew, that would knock it over. And anything that's combustible, people would vaporize. Anything that is in uh, combustible, this invades it so viciously that they just smoke. But no movement. There's no, it has no mass. It's just some kind of like a soap bubble bubbling up. And then the, the mass is all in the black. That's where your mass is. That's what your gravity is. That's your dark matter. It's your muon. Okay, this is what they say about fractals. A fractal is a type of mathematical shape that are infinitely complex. And they are or, um, molecules and atoms and all kinds of complex things, enzymes, unbelievably complex. In essence, a fractal is a pattern that repeats forever, and every part of the fractal, regardless of how zoomed in or zoomed out you are, looks very similar to the whole image. Fractals surround us in so many different aspects of life. This is, as I showed you, CERN and, um, and the rest of them, they all see the same patterns. They, they see these exact same patterns. They call them Higgs fields. Well, they start out as light, which is nothing more than a Higgs field. We crushed it and separated the particles, and then when they came back together, they created more Higgs fields. Right? When they came back together, the white was separated. When it came back together, it created those same Higgs fields. I think I've shown this pretty well, so I'm going to lock this up, and i get a couple more things to say, and then we'll call it a day. Okay, so we're talking about fractals and their repeating patterns. Well, guess what? This is a galaxy. All right, and guess what this is? This is from CERN or Fermilab where they're smashing particles together and it makes those circular patterns like that. All right, and this is what they look like when they smash together. This is a simulated Higgs event at L the Large Hadron Collider and they make these patterns over and over and over. Now, I showed you that we make the pattern of light. That's just light coming through the air. You never see that, though, until it becomes accelerated, and we were just fortunate enough to capture it right like that. So that is a, basically a Higgs field. It's the same as a Higgs field. All right, that's the same as this field right here. Basically identical, no difference whatsoever. Only these are from big particles. We're using the light. And this is also the same field like here, the same as the galaxy, the same as the Higgs fields that we created in our light experiments. These are fractals, yes. It goes all the way from the tiniest particles all the way up to galaxies and universes. And I, I also believe I have shown that we, light slows down. There's no question whatsoever in my mind that coming through these fields and dust particles and light particles, they boop, 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 and then they start to stretch out and they look like light's being pulled away because of expansion, but it's not. It's just slowing down. We have to get away from these constraints and these laws and these constants, which are just, they're just not right. They were only made up to solve one little issue. And then they become constants. We have to live with it. The speed of light never changes. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous, basically. And anybody that understands light whatsoever, I just, I've shown you over and over and over that we can accelerate it. We can split it. Anyway, I've got some other stuff I'm doing here today. So I'm going to get back to that. But fractals, you know, it's, they're not all that confusing. And once you start building... Um, molecules, that's when it really comes into play because the magnetic fields interact with other magnetic fields and they become entwined like this. But they're in a fractal pattern. They're going to be a circular round pattern of magnetism for, for, for everything. Everything has its own magnetic field. Every single particle. And you can see every single gas in the air is lighting up. You see it? All of those are particles that are in the air, gases more than likely. 
And because this is forcing its way through those gases, they're re responding kind of severely. Normally, they just sort of walk, get out of the way. But this is accelerating through there and going to eventually exceed the speed of light, which would, it would normally just go a certain speed. Yes, I, I can go along with that. But when you put stuff in front of it, it slows it down. And in this case, we're accelerating through that stuff. It's got to get out of the way, and it is glowing like crazy. So every particle there is, I don't care what it is, has these white particles attached to it. And when they get pushed, they glow. It's called the cashmere effect. When two fields come together, the field in between glows like crazy and it produces all kinds of energy. There it is right there. So that's it for today, my friends. All right, I love you all. Pay attention to this stuff and speak up. You know, we're, we're, we're not doing what we should be doing with understanding the subatomic realm. And dipole electron flood theory is the only way out of this. It's the only way it works. And that's my theory. 1823 little dipoles, just like little bar magnets, make up a proton. Not a couple of quarks and some of this and some of that, no. They have a particle zoo, they call it. Well, we don't need a zoo. We got two one. You got the white and the black. That makes up everything. But 1,823 or so of those white and black particles make up one proton. All right? I love you all. Bye. Now, check this out. This is the fractal patterns. Now, I'm talking to my friend Harry the other day, and he's telling me about this this water memory right and he's pointing to the fact that you can take a glass plate like this and put it over a picture and I'm not exactly sure whether it was really frozen solid and then they poured the water on or what happened but you it created these patterns and you could actually see the picture in these patterns. You could, he had a sailboat and all kinds of, all, all different ones. And you could very, very clearly see them. There was no question whatsoever. So we're talking about it, and I came up to the conclusion that the, dark, the different colors have different, different bounce back of photons. And that's what is creating the patterns related to the color and the darkness, basically. Now, mostly it's the darkness. And um, you could clearly see the, you know, the, everything. You could see it, but no question whatsoever. It was making pictures. And so he was talking about having a memory. Well, that's not really a memory. That's just, it's reacting. The water molecules are reacting to how much excitement they're getting from the bounce back of light. The darker it is, the less excited it will be. And it's primarily, it's the shades. I don't think it's got anything really to do with color, but color is nothing more than a shade of something, basically. So, it was very interesting, though. Well, okay, my friends, I am excited. This is Sabine Hofsenfelder, and she says, Today I present the five biggest physics mysteries according to me, which is according to her. Now, let's see what she has to say, and can Roger solve any of these? Well, Roger says he thinks he can. Let's see what she has to say. And I'll stop this as we go along, just to make sure that you understand what she is saying. Hey, I present the five biggest physics mysteries, according to me. Number five, Einstein's theories don't forbid faster than light travel. All right, can we go faster than light? Hold on. That's one thing. Obviously, that's an easy one to understand. Can we go faster than the speed of light? I think we can. Well, we just don't know how to cross from speeds below the speed of light to above. Is it possible? And if so, how? Number four, time seems to have a direction. We know that that's because entropy increases, but that... All right, this is one that time is, it incrementally goes forward. There is no going back in time that I can understand. Time just continues. All right, so that's my opinion on that. And there is no way to deal with that one, so let's go on. It means the universe must have started out at small entropy. What? I do want to talk about a video that I am going to be doing. It's going to be called The Big Bang, The Big God, or The Big Mystery. And all of those things, I think, could be true. Because everything came from somewhere. 
I mean, it had to come from somewhere. So, it, 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 everything in the ancient texts talk about God, and everything I have found supports that evidence. So, you know, there's a big mystery, though. Where do you go after you continue on through this realm? So that's kind of tricky. So she's asking about that. Why? Number three, just what's a measurement? All right, measurements are arbitrary. You know, some people use millimeters, some people use inches, some use, you know, that type of thing. It's just a, a distance, basically a distance or a quantity or, you know, some measurement, some amount. Basically, that's a, that. Physicists say if it measures something, we call it a measurement, but that doesn't explain anything. Number two, Coitus formula is the relation between the masses of three elementary particles. The el I can do that very simply. And there isn't three elementary particles, there's only two. And that's the electron neutrino and the muon neutrino. Electron, the muon, and the tau that comes out two over three to an accuracy of five digits after the point. Coitus Okay, I can tell you. Well, anyway, we'll go. I'll, I'll be explaining all this in detail. I don't think so. Number one, just why do things have units? Time, length, energy, mass, what are they? Are you well, that's another thing that's just sort of kind of silly to speak about. Everything has, has a, a, a unit measurement. It's like in a periodic table. Each one of these is stable at a certain point. A unit would be some form of a stable thing. You can assign inches as units. This is an inch, this is two inches. That's just division of the distances. That's all that is. This, these are truly units. Because hydrogen in the atomic model that I have, which is correct, by the way, hydrogen is 1825 or so dipole electrons and each one as she asked about how much things weigh each one of the hydrogen dipoles weighs approximately 0 0.0005854 something like that atomic mass units well all you do is take 1823 particles would we'll take one and divide it by 1823 and whatever that number is approximately is what one of the dipoles is. And this is what a proton looks like. It doesn't look like this and have a couple of quarks in there and so forth. It's 1823 dipoles. And the dipole flood theory here on the internet is the atomic model of a proton. If this is it, what it is. And all of the dark stuff goes right to the center, and this is all coated with white around it. Anytime you get to the atomic level, which is here, all of these are completely coated with electrons. So we can never see inside to where the dark matter was. It's like this. You're looking for the dark matter, you can't see it. It's inside. And all of the white is surrounding it and it bounces back at you. That's the whole idea. That's why we, it's just, it's right in front of us. We just never realized it was there. Everything weighs something. How do you think it weighs something? The dark matter is the only part that has a weight. The white has virtually no weight. And that's exactly what they say at Fermilab. It shows the same particles we found, identical same particles. And it says the black one has all the weight and it has, a, has all the mass. The extended particle, the black one, is a fixed size, never changes, I agree with that 100%. Has a fuzzy edge around it, I agree with that 100%. The point-like particles are mathematical extractions, zero size, of virtually no weight whatsoever to them. But they do have a field, an energy of field surrounding something. There has to be some weight to them. Like I've, the only thing I can equate it to is, is like a soap bubble. So that one there is just a fixed one, never changes. That one's going to be like this. The one down here is going to be fluffy or get small or big or whatever, but it's like a balloon. And with maybe like a very, very, very fine skin around it, basically, which is the field. But is what is the field constructed of? It's magnetism. It's magnetic. And when you bash into it, it, it glows. It, it, it's like taking a balloon and popping it. Something like that. That's the only thing I can equate it to.